G'day, Peter. Hi, yes, Peter. Brian. Hi there. Thank you for being patient. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm. I'm actually calling from Hong Kong and um, mm-hmm. relating to your previous story about the the shootings in terms of the uh, security guards in and helping your uh, your friend's wife and so forth. That um, oh yes, I've been in. Yeah, I've been in in Hong Kong for uh, four years now, and, and mm-hmm. I've been working here in Asia for the last twenty years. I think I, I called your program a few months ago into oh, yes. other the program and. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, I did work in the central building in, in Hong Kong. I do recall the security guards having those sawn-off shotguns and, mm. and somewhat using them indiscriminately before the handover in yeah. 97. And, um, so it's, ch- it's changed now, has it? Well, things have changed, but mm-hmm. I, 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 they've changed dramatically. And, um, I mean, that, wasn't, that was one reason I called up. And the other reason, obviously, is I heard a lot of callers talking about, and obviously yourself, about the... The, the, the current uh, government and, and hopefully um, they're, they're capable of handling the economic headwinds that are about to and to on Australia. I mean, mm-hmm. the most important thing that, that's, um, that's a problem, I think, over the next year or so or a few years is, is actually Australia's uh, position economically, both within the region and globally. And the most mm-hmm. important thing, one, to realise is that, as you mentioned, debt is getting out of control. And if we do head the way of uh, the USA... Mm-hmm. then we're going to confuse cyclical unemployment with structural unemployment. And by that I mean that um, we need a workforce to at least counter for the change in terms of when the mining industry comes up the boil to mm-hmm. rely on the rest of the hollow industry. I'm not quite sure. I don't think we've got a backup plan for that one. Well, well that's the main concern. I mean, I, I, yeah. without giving away um, my current um, occupation, mm-hmm. I yeah. work in the finance industry in one of the largest yes. national banks, mm-hmm. and I do trade the Australian market from an interest rate speculative and currency perspective, mm-hmm. the main concern is that the Australian dollar now is extremely strong. Mm. And it appears extremely strong because the people see the Australian dollar against the US dollar. What the US economy has been doing over the last year or so is doing extreme monetary policy easing to the point where they're printing money. And it yeah. appears that strengthen the other currencies. So where does that leave Australia? When, when over the next three to six months, and uh, without giving away too much detail, there are a lot of bilateral mm. commodity agreements with China yeah. that are coming off the boil. So China will skirt far and wide to see where it's most cost-effective to at least renegotiate those contracts in terms of importing commodities and so yep. forth. Mm-hmm. And Australia will have a problem. And the other reason why Australia is the dollar supported extremely strong, there are another lot of financial journalists in Australia say they're perplexed by the reason. The main reason is the AAA rating of Australian sovereigns. Now, a lot of sovereigns around the world need to diversify their reserves. And there are very few countries that have a AAA credit rating. One is Australia. So to its detriment, yeah. the fact that the country has done extremely well from an international credit perspective, mm. it's, it's unfortunately supporting a very high Australian dollar, which will become very uncompetitive. Now, we do work mm. in a global economy, so unless you close those doors and you put on controls, exchange controls, we are subject to the women fate of competitive pricing in terms of commodities, B, um, repricing offshore in terms of like uh, facilities, in terms of callback centers and so forth. So before we floated the dollar, we weren't subject to this sort of thing? Well, we, we well, don't forget, before we floated the dollar, you're, you're talking now back in the early 80s, yeah. and even way before then we had the bread and wood removed and we had the gold standard and oh, yes. the currencies. Mm. So... You know, we're in a different age now where we've had a lot of emerging economies coming in, mm. in Southeast Asia. Now, uh, we're free Australians, as you quite rightly, and we do like, we do like to have choice, but along with that choice becomes, comes social responsibility and, and obviously economic and sovereign responsibility. So you just can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't protect the Australian consumer or the worker at the same time mm. and become competitive in Asia. If you want to do that, yep. you need to shut the doors. So I don't know why the Australian public is focused more so on character assassinations or, or <laughs> dramatizations of its leaders rather yeah. than focusing on the real issue in terms mm. of unemployment. The U.S. interest rates are the lowest they've ever been in the last 30 years. All you need to do is pull mm. up the chart from 1980 to 2012. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're almost zero. Australia is heading that way. And once you, once you ease the credit to a, a level of so low that the most important thing that, that the American consumer is facing right now is confidence. If you don't have confidence, you cannot go out there and purchase goods. And mm-hmm. where does confidence come from? It comes from job security. So unless you have a, a, a workforce that is educated to deal with structural unemployment rather than cyclical unemployment, 
you are going to have these long-term effects. And that's what I'm afraid of is potentially happening in Australia. And I don't think the current government is fairly competent in doing that. I mean, in terms of mm-hmm. getting into a surplus and so forth. So I'll leave it, leave it at that point because I think yeah. I've... Can I just ask you about the renminbi? I made four trips to China in the early 80s, early to mid-80s, and each time we were told, don't get much change in renminbi because you won't be able to change it back into Aussie dollars. And we thought, poor Chinese people ripped off with this monopoly money. And after a couple of years, it dawned on me it was really clever to have a currency that was non-convertible. It meant the Chinese people could only buy goods and services inside China. They needed American dollars before they could import stuff, so they didn't get to import too much because at the time, in the 80s, it was just opening up and not many people had American dollars. And I wish Australia could have something like that. But I understand it's being opened up now and there is some convertibility. Is that correct? That's correct. There, there, are, there, are, there are two types of issues that you've sort of pointed on there. There is, there is, convertib- there is actually renminbi um, convertibility in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. a separate market called the Chinese renminbi, and there is obviously the, um, the renminbi convertibility in China. Now... What China is doing after 1997 is they're using the Hong Kong financial market as a as a litmus test. In other words, as a laboratory where they oh, yeah. introduce their policies and so forth. So, mm. if for example uh, McDonald's wants to raise financing uh, in China to expand to expand, say, outlets, retail outlets, yep. that would come mm. to Hong Kong and yeah. that would issue a renminbi in Hong Kong bond. In other words, to to allow people to purchase that bond, mm. to i.e. suck funds into that bond. In other words, to allow for their expansion for retail outlets in China. So that, that is actually happening right now. They're, yeah. they're extremely clever. They're very methodical. And the most important thing here I need to stress, Brian, is, is this, and I'm not sure if you're aware of it or some of the listeners, that is uh, China is halfway through a five-year uh, economic uh, policy which they're going from export-led to mm. domestic consumption. Yeah. This is crucial. In terms of, the Chinese are very forward-thinking, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. obviously, with that flag planting and so forth. Mm. They realize that the world is changing, and they realize that um, they have a growing middle class. Mm. So in order to allow for that to change, they, they've gone through, a, they're halfway through a five-year plan. They're going from a domestic export-led uh, a growth economy to somewhat of our domestic consumption. Now, there may be hiccups along the way. Yeah. And but is it true that their internal market is so huge that the exports are only about 10% of total factory production is that right that's 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 very true that, mm. that's absolutely correct and um there are various resources to verify what you've just said then one is the imf mm. two is the world bank and three obviously there uh, there are various financial institutions which allow you to have that data the, mm. the, the difficulty about china and so forth is the lack of transparency in their economic data and yeah. the tendency to fudge it so so I hope I don't get a cut off on this sort of line because I am calling you from Hong Kong. But the most important yeah. thing I need to stress here that we need a government in Australia to understand that the economic headwinds do not solely rest with Europe, the US, but obviously North Asia is a fairly large component. Mm. Um, and that we, in, in, when, when the commodity cycle goes through um, a trough, that the, the Australian economy is robust enough to at least enable it to at least withstand you know, the mass unemployment because this is what's happening in the US. You know... You know, the governments tend to get on their high heels and, and gloat about lower interest rates and so forth. But the reason why we have low interest rates is the economy is going through a potential downturn. Yeah. What happens when you have the Japanization of the global economy, when you so much so that you push rates to 0% and you still cannot instill confidence, A, in the industries to lay on more workers, or mm. B, more importantly, the consumer? You're in a real horrible situation. And that's, that's I'm afraid that's what... Um, that may happen to Australia. I certainly hope it doesn't, but that's mm. something that, that we, one cannot stay. But unfortunately, the fact that Australia's had a good sovereign credit rating um, has artificially allowed the um, Australian dollar to be well supported. It's not necessarily that it's doing well. Mm-hmm. That other, other global economies are printing so much money that are somewhat giving a visual distortion of a stronger Australian dollar. Don't forget, the Australian dollar is always against the currency pair. Yeah always against the current. And I think you mean we're, we're compared with America? America goes yeah. down, it looks like we've gone up, and so we're, oh, we're really cool, our, our money went up, but we should be comparing it with a basket of a currency, shouldn't Absolutely. we? Absolutely. If you look at all the media outlets in Australia, they obviously compare it against the US dollar, and I think yeah. over the last 10 to 15 years, that's changed. It's got to be against North Asia, and most of our, most importantly, one has to understand the terms of trade. Yeah. The terms of trade are with, with obviously with, uh, with Asia. Of course, Europe and the US are conduits.